It's a distinct pleasure for me today to introduce our featured speaker of the day, Eddie Sachs, who is billed as the greatest failure in the history of racing. <laughs> Eddie? <laughs> Being uh, in the radio industry, if you'll pardon this, I would like to, a commercial, I'd like to uh, maybe have a question and answer session rather than just a boring talk from a uh, speedway driver. Could you quite possibly tell me what was your strategy in starting 27th in last year's speedway race? <laughs> What my strategy was in starting 27th? That is the most unusual question. My strategy was that I failed to negotiate the track with three wheels on the first day of qualifications. And on the second day of qualifications, I was still in a nervous state. And it took me the five days to relax through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday and get my nerve back again and then I qualified on the third day, and that qualification put me in the 27th position. And you ended up second. That's that Third. Was third. I, frankly, I won the race, but they paid me for third. <laughs> <laughs> All those instruments down. <laughs> um, you know, there, we've had uh, scandals as far as betting is concerned. Football, you might have heard of Paul Harning and um, Alex Karras. And they've talked about basketball scandals, too. Do you think that there'll ever be a scandal in racing? Do race drivers bet on themselves? There will be a scandal in automobile racing. There, there will be? Oh, yes, definitely. Very shortly. Very shortly. Please clear this up. Well, uh, they're going to catch me betting on me. <laughs> <laughs> Getting back to racing. <laughs> What happened uh, last week at Trenton, New Jersey? Wasn't there a group of drivers that went down there for a weekend? Last week at Trenton was like the beginning of... It was like the beginning of... It was like sending that, that first man out into outer space. As far as our, our whole country was concerned, it was a proud moment for us. And in our racing business, Last week, again, the rear engine machines proved what the Lotus Ford proved the other day at the Indianapolis Speedway, that we all had obsolete equipment and that there are going to be major, major changes in the profession. And over the next three to four years now, you will see radical changes. You will see cars of the future start to come out and they will be all rear, rear engine machines. The last week at Trenton, they had a Cooper at the track, and this darn Cooper <laughs> created a tremendous problem. And do you mind if I give somebody a plug? Please do. Competition. <laughs> All right. Yeah, you won't like it after I say it. Uh, <clears throat> a week from Saturday, watch your ABC Wide World of Sports and you'll see the Trenton race on ABC Wide World of Sports a week from Saturday. And you'll see what's going to happen at your Indianapolis 500 mile race. You're gonna see what's gonna happen on all the major racetracks of the nation when these Coopers and Lotus cars start performing against our Offenhauser cars and our A.J. Watson chassis and so forth. I understand though, getting back to these Lotus Fords that uh <clears throat> they may not get to Indianapolis because uh, aren't they coming into Detroit and then they're, yeah. they're supposed to be, uh, is there a Speedway Van Lines? A Speedway Van Lines, Are right. Are you connected with this line at all? I'm president of it. <laughs> <laughs> and you're responsible for getting these Fords to Indianapolis. I'm responsible for getting the Lotus Fords to Indianapolis Speedway. Have you given your driver any instructions? <laughs> I told him to, when he wrecks it, to make sure it's a total wreck. <laughs> completely demolished. <laughs> Eddie, um, do you think that you can handle the rest of the program by yourself? No. Are you nervous? Yes. <laughs> Please I, take over. Oh, come on. I, I want you to stay up here with me All for right. a half an hour or so. <laughs>
But I will, let me say this, though, about the Speedway van lines. They're going to fly the cars. The Lotus automobiles will arrive in the United States uh, sometime Friday morning, I would imagine. And when they land, we will clear them through customs at Detroit, Michigan, and immediately upon clearing them through customs, we will load them inside of one of my vans and their equipment, and the best man that I have on the road is going to drive them right straight from Detroit to the Indianapolis Speedway, and I would imagine that they will arrive sometime Saturday evening late, and we'll unload them Sunday on the day of the Yankee 300. And uh, we'll unload them. I don't know where we're going to get all of the photographers we're going to need. Because <laughs> I'm even going to buy some myself. But we're bringing them in. And honestly, if, the, if my man does have a wreck, I would appreciate it if each of you would say a prayer that if we do have a wreck, that he does totally demolish them. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, I also, I'm not real familiar with racing, understand this, and I'm sort of flying by the seat of my pants, but I know that you're going to drive a brand new car. Are there any new mechanical innovations with this car? All right, let me tell them about it. Please do. First of all, before I even swing into my car and my ideas or my mechanics ideas or the Bryant Heating and Cooling Company's ideas, let me first tell you that I am really, I'm really proud to be here today for several reasons. This is the very first time that I've ever made a presentation in Lafayette to a group other than at Purdue University. And second, George Sauter knows exactly how I feel. I'm not trying to tell you how old he is, but I was born in 1927. And George Sauter has been the only racing driver that I have ever really, an ex-winner of the race, a winner of the Indianapolis 500, that I have felt that in my heart that this man I would want to be part of me because he won the race two days after I was born. And gosh, Last year and the year before last, I've always looked him up, I've always found him, and I've always had a photographer take a picture of George and I because, boy, I wanted that 1927 winner and that winner of that year's race with a picture of the two of us. And I'm really proud of you, George. I'm really proud of you. And over here, this fellow Bob Higman, I drove for Bob Higman for years. Now, he is a race car mechanic, and he's as good as they make them. And he has equipment this year at the Speedway that I believe is second to none. And he rates this kind of equipment. And he has Bobby Grimm as a driver. But there's more to it than just that. Out on the racing circuits, in the midget tracks, and out on the big car circuits, he is always hired or used by someone of importance in the racing industry as a mechanic, as a chief mechanic, and on the midget tracks and the midget circuits, he owns all of his own equipment and operates his own equipment and hires drivers. I have been one of his drivers at one time or another. And I would imagine that in order to do what he's doing, he has to have an income from someplace. He's got to have some money because this, this, this business just doesn't make any money. And so he must be a tremendous or a very, very successful farmer. And, <laughs> and Bob, thank you for coming by today. Thank you very much. Fellas, people ask me, say, excuse me, just one minute. Let me check something out here. How much time do I have? Okay, thank you. People ask me, Eddie, Eddie, how do you become a racing driver? What do you do to become a racing driver? And I thought about it, and I have put together some of my own ideas, and I tried to put together, instead of other fellows, I took my own career as a racing driver, and I went back over time, and if I were to write a book, it would go something like this. When I was in college, I came home for a weekend, 
And just like any young guy in college, Sunday morning, my dad and I have the sports section of the paper, and we're checking all of the football scores of the major universities and colleges. We're in the football season, and Dad and I are talking about this school and that school and this player and that player, and we're watching all the different football games and the scores of the games. And all of a sudden, there's an ad in the, on one of the pages of the sports section, an ad about this big. And it said, Big Car Auto Races Today, right out at the Greensboro Fairgrounds, Greensboro, North Carolina. Boy, they're having races today right out at the fairgrounds. And I said, Dad, Dad, look, they're going to have automobile races today out at the fairgrounds. Did any of these drivers ever drive for you? Now, I have to clarify this. My father, from the time that I was a baby, and as I grew, and as he fondled me and cuddled me, as he talked with me and walked with me, as he threw me into the air and just was a pal with me, my dad always mentioned to me, as I grew older, that when I was just a tot, he was a very, very wealthy man. He used to be fantastically wealthy. Yes, sir, Eddie, when I was, when Eddie, when you were just a little baby boy, I used to have Packard Phaetons, Cords, Duesenbergs, racing cars, airplanes, stables of horses. Why, Eddie, before you could even walk, I bought a pony for you. Yes, sir, my dad, first of all, was a salesman. <laughs> and boy, he was a tremendous bullshooter. <laughs> So I had remembered over the years that my father had owned racing cars. When I saw this ad, did any of these drivers ever drive for you? Boy, my dad went down the list of drivers' names, and all of a sudden he said, Yeah, 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 that guy, he used to drive for me. And I saw the name Dutch Culp from Allentown, Pennsylvania. And I decided I'm going to go out to the fairgrounds and see this guy, Dutch Culp. I'm going to go out and see how good he is. And to show you that fate plays a big part a big portion of our lives, I went out to the fairgrounds and started just right. I walked up to the gate and instead of buying a ticket, I told the guy in the gate that I was Dutch Culp's mechanic. I just flew in from Pennsylvania and the guy let me go through the gate. I'm down in the pit gate and that guy doesn't believe me. <laughs> when he turned his back, I'm 19 years old. When he turns his back, I just run. Boy, I'm running through the gate, and I run up, over, down, and across, and I'm down in the pits, and I'm down in the pits, and I ran up to one man, and I said, who's Dutch Culp? And he pointed to him. I ran over to Dutch Culp, stuck my hand out, and I said, my name's Eddie Sachs, and you used to drive for my dad. And Dutch Culp jumped up, grabbed my hand, and he went, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why, I remember your dad. And the guy that was chasing me, he saw Dutch and I so happy to see each other that he thought I was with Dutch, and he turned around and left me alone. <laughs> and I stayed in the pits all afternoon. I watched them. <laughs> Fellas, when those guys would get introduced and when they would run the races, the people in the stands and the grandstands were screaming and hollering. Well, these guys were famous. And, man, when the, when the races were over with, Dutch Culp went out to get his tow car, and he drives in with a brand new Cadillac, loads his own personal racing car up on a trailer. Why, my God, these guys are rich. They're rich. They're famous. What am I going to school for and getting all this education? Why don't I just become a racing driver? And this is, honestly, when you're 19 years old, you think this way sometimes. Man, I said to myself, it's ridiculous going to school and getting an education when all I've got to do is just start driving racing cars and I'll become rich and famous. So I immediately told Dutch about this. And Dutch said to me, Well, boy, how can you be sure that you could drive a racing car? And I said, oh, uh, it'd be nothing to it, Dutch, nothing to it. Well, now, boy, he says, how can you be sure? And I said, Mr. Culp, there's never been anybody that's ever beat me from a red light. 
<laughs> Boy, I thought that's all there was to it. I went back to school, packed my bags, and met Dutch Culp the following Saturday at Raleigh, North Carolina. I put my bags on a trailer and in the trunk of his car and wherever I could put my stuff and rode with him overnight after that Raleigh race to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, to the Williams Grove Speedway. We arrived at the Grove and it was rained out. Dutch took off for Allentown and his home and as we rolled into the city of Allentown, Dutch says, uh, my boy, where should I drop you off? And I said, well, just drop me off right downtown someplace and I'll take care of myself. And if you'll give me your address, I'll come by your garage and your shop during the day and the evenings and, and maybe you'll let me go to some more of the races with you. Where are you racing next week? Well, boy, we don't race nowhere until spring. This was the last race of the year that was rained out today. <laughs> Man, and I just quit school. Boy, I got to make a living all winter now. I got through the winter okay. And by the way, I might as well tell you this about Dutch. Dutch was just like my dad. He was a tremendous bull shooter too. <laughs> In the spring of the year, I started following the races. I went for a half a season and a man said to me, look, you're hanging around Allentown and you're hanging around these different races and you're going to all these big time events. But boy, you're following the wrong circuit. You're following all the big time guys. You're following the class A stuff. You'll never get a chance to drive this way. Why don't you go on one of the class B circuits? Start hanging around somebody right here in Allentown. And again, again, fate. And I'm strong about this. This man says to me, there's a man right here in Allentown whose name is Charlie Sachs, the same name as you have. And he owns the best Class B car in the United States. And sure enough, right there in Allentown was a man by the name of, the only man in the United States by the name of Sachs that was in the racing car business. And he lived right there in Allentown. And I went over to his garage and I walked in and I stuck my hand out and I said, I'm looking for Charlie Sachs. And he said, I'm Charlie. I said, I'm Eddie Sachs. <laughs> and he should have thrown me out right then and there. But he let me hang around. Six weeks I hung around. I'm telling you that finally he said to me, let's go to lunch, boy. And we get to lunch and we're sitting there and he said, there's one thing about you we can tell. We can tell that you definitely are going to hang around. <laughs> Now he said, look, he said, uh, if, since you're going to hang around, we're going to do this. There's no sense in your doing nothing. We're going to put you to work in the garage. Now we work in pla passenger cars during the day. In the evenings, we work in the race cars. From 8 o'clock in the morning till 5 at night, pay you $15 a week. At 6 o'clock at night, you return and we work in the race cars to whatever time we quit. You travel with us every weekend to the automobile races that we go to and you pay all of your own expenses. Man, and I thought this is a good deal. 15 bucks a week and pay all of my own expenses. <laughs> and they started taking me out on the circuit. <clears throat> I don't know how they could do it, but they used to run, uh, every weekend they ran Saturday and Sunday. And they would, and they would test me. And they would th put me through all kinds of tests. Uh, to give you an example or two. Saturday, they'd race and check in a hotel Saturday night. As they would sign the register, they would turn to me and say, are you checking in? And I'd look and say, "Why, well, no, I'm broke. <laughs> well, that's too bad. Mr. Desk Clerk, Mr. Desk Clerk, <clears throat> we know this boy, and he's not a bum. If he does come in the lobby this evening and he tries to sleep in the lobby, Throw him out. <laughs> Don't let him make a bum of himself. And the desk clerk would agree. And then they'd go out to the car and they'd take their luggage out. And as they would take their luggage out, they would lock the car doors. And I'd say, wait, wait, don't lock the car. I'll sleep in the car. And they'd look at me and they'd say, 
No, Eddie, we, we better lock the car. We don't know whether we can trust you yet or not. And they'd leave me standing on the sidewalk when they'd go to bed. And honest to God, when I would finally get so tired, I would go back to the race car cockpit, peel the canvas cockpit cover off of it, and I would slide in and sit in the cockpit of the race car and take a hold of the steering wheel, and I guess I'd sit there and make believe I was driving it and go off to sleep and dream that I was driving a race car. And I'll bet you that during that summertime, I slept better on Saturday nights than they did. <laughs> but they put me through all kinds of tests, and finally, when they were convinced that I really wanted to be a driver, we went to, a, we went to lunch one day, and we're sitting at lunch, just a gang of us from around the garage, and Charlie Sachs announces that they have talked it over and that they have decided that they're going to let me become a racing driver. And that there's going to be a race at Gratz, Pennsylvania next Sunday, and that I am going to drive my first race. Now they said, Eddie, we're not going to let you drive our car. <laughs> we know a guy that's going to be there that's not going to have a driver. Now we've got to teach you. And they spent the entire afternoon teaching me how to become a racing driver. And this is what they taught me. When we get to the track and you're in the pits, whenever you're in the pits at any track, always remember this, where you are. Eddie, if you're in the pits at a track, inevitably people you're talking to will ask you, where are you from? If we're out in the Midwest, tell them you're from the East. If we're on the East Coast racing, tell them you're from the Midwest. If we're at a big car race, tell them you're a midget driver. If we happen to be at a midget race, tell them you're a big car driver. If we're at a dirt track, tell them that you drive on asphalt tracks only. If we're at an asphalt track, tell them that you drive on dirt tracks. No matter what the situation is of a particular day, always reverse it completely, and they'll never be able to nail you to the cross. Now they said, Eddie, you're 19 years old. I'm sorry, I just about turned 20 then. They said, you're 20 years old, and Eddie, you're no different than any guy 20 years old. You're exactly the same, and we've seen them come and go. Eddie, we've seen dozens and dozens of them come and go. They come in and they ask us, they want to be race drivers. They want to do this. They want to do that. Just give me one chance, mister. Just give me one chance, and I'll show you. And Eddie, you're no different than all the rest of them. And Eddie, when we do give you this one chance, when we let you drive that first racing car, Eddie, it isn't going to be exactly like you think it's going to be. You keep telling us to give you one chance, and you're going to show us. But Eddie, it isn't going to work that way. When you climb in that first race car, and when you punch that gas down to the floor, things are going to happen to you that you've never dreamed of before. And Eddie, it's going to scare you so bad. It's going to scare you so bad that your foot's going to come back off that gas so fast, it might break your foot. <laughs> and Eddie, when you drive back in the pits, and when the guy that owns the car looks at you and says, what's wrong? You just say, well, mister, this car's not getting enough gas. <laughs> and you'll always be right. Man, they took me to Gratz, they introduced me to this guy, and he puts this great champion into his car. I rolled from the pits for the tow truck, and the car stopped on the back straight away. Tow truck came and got me. Car, I started it, and it stopped on the front straight away. Tow truck, stopped on the back straight away. Tow truck, stopped on, eight times. Man wants to know what's wrong, the car owner. I'm in the pits, and I'm talking to him, and I said, 
Well, mister, this car's not getting enough gas. And he said, he said, jump out, let me try it. And he took my helmet, jumps in the car, the tow truck takes him off, and he drove all the way around the track perfectly and back to the pits, stopped the car, and said to me, you were right. It wasn't getting enough gas. You weren't even going fast enough to keep the engine running. <laughs> he takes my helmet off, throws it to me, and says, beat it. So he knows he was duped. I grabbed the helmet, and I put it under my arm, and I stood straight in the air, and I looked at him, and I went, huh. <laughs> Boy, and I turned around, and I walked. I strutted. Man, I'm strutting down through those pits. And again, fate. Again, fate. Never in my career can I ever remember or have I ever seen a day that there were two big cars at a track and no drivers available to drive them. Here's a car sitting down here without a driver, and Johnny Apple, who is Charlie Sachs' best friend, knows this, and he sees me walking down through the pits, and with carrying that helmet, and he knew something had gone wrong, and he hollered to me, hey, come here. And I walked over, and Johnny Apple said, get into this car and drive this car. And I said, well, who owns the car, John? Get in the car. I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Boy, and I put the helmet on, and oh, man, I got all buckled up, and I climbed in one leg in the cockpit, and the other leg down, I slid down in there, and I, I got a hold of the safety belt, and Boy, I got the safety belt all hooked up nice and tight, and I reached up, and I got a hold of the steering wheel, and, man, I'm ready to go. Boy, and just then, here comes a nice little roly-poly man running down and across, and he owns the car. He runs up, takes one look, and says, What's going on here? And Johnny Apple stood beautifully and said, Look who's going to drive for you. <laughs> and the guy went, who the hell is that? <laughs> and Johnny Apple said, can't you see who it is? And the guy went, oh yeah! <laughs> and the minute the man showed excitement, Johnny Apple looked at me and quickly said, look kid, it's too late to warm up. Take it out and qualify it. <laughs> so help me, God, thank God he said, take it out and qualify it. Now, I can't do this perfectly. I'll try to do it as best I can. And I can't do it perfectly. But I came around for the green flag, and they dropped that green flag, and it was something like this. I'm coming down the straightaway for the green flag. Oh, man, I got the green flag, and oh, man, the, oh, the turn came up on me, and I went, oh, 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 I'm on that straightaway again, and I'm going down a backstretch, and all of a sudden the turn, oh, oh, God. Fellas, honest to God, I got back in the pits, I got the car stopped, I finished my qualification, and I'm sitting there. <laughs> Boy, I'm safe. I'm safe. Man, I'm sitting there and I'm safe and I'm... <laughs> uh, Johnny Apple comes running over to me and Johnny Apple looks down at me and he said, What'd you do? Hold your breath for two laps? <laughs> uh, uh, oh, Johnny. Oh, Johnny. Did I set a new track record? And he looked down at me and he said, Eddie, you just turned the slowest time that's ever been turned at this track. <laughs> oh, oh, Johnny, I was really sideways going through the turns. He says to me, he says, you weren't even two inches out of line. Fellas, all of a sudden, something attracted my attention. I looked down into the cockpit. And honest to God, both of my legs were jumping up and down this high. My legs were sitting there, and I can't even get out of the car. And I reached down to unhook the safety belt. Ooh, and I was all wet. <laughs> Man, when you can't even control yourself. Boy. <laughs> then, 
About six weeks slipped by, and another fellow hired me at Pittman, New Jersey. And I finished fourth. And I went through an entire winter telling people about the first race that I ever drove in, I finished fourth. I tell you, I, I told people that I didn't even know about it. Man, I was so proud that I finished fourth in the first race that I ever drove in. But what I didn't tell people was that it was the consolation race, the bread and butter, the cheap race of the day, and that they had a short field of cars. Remember the big cars? You want to get to the big cars. So I went to the first midget race of the year at Hatfield, Pennsylvania. I'm at this midget race, standing at the pit gate, and as the cars are being towed through, I very nicely would ask, do you need a driver? Nope. Another guy would go through. Need a driver? Nope. And all of a sudden, I found a sucker. This guy looks out at me and says, <clears throat> says, boy, are you a driver? I said, yes, sir. So, well, boys, you just come right on in the pits and you just talk to me. And I did. And this guy tells me his name is Russ Wilson from Richmond, Virginia. And he owns this car and he doesn't like his driver. He won't fire him today. And I talked to him and I told him what a famous big car driver I was from the Midwest. And that I wanted to switch to the midgets. And he made a deal with me. Next Tuesday night at Norfolk, Virginia. And I went there. And I saw for the first time in my life a flat quarter of a mile asphalt track. I climbed into his midget, warmed up, and when it came time to hot lap or to really start running fast, I went down the straightaway into the turn and lost control. Now, I didn't lose control bad enough that I hit anything. I'd just take a long slide. The slide would stop and I'd get her under control again. And I'd go down the back straightaway into that turn and I'd lose control. Now, I never hit anything, I never hit any other cars, I never became involved in a wreck, but I never went into a turn that I didn't lose control. I lost control every time. And when I stopped the car and Russ Wilson said to me, Boy, what seems to be your trouble? I said, Well, Mr. Wilson, this is an asphalt track, and I'm a dirt track driver. <laughs> And he said to me, yes, I can see that. Well, we won't do too good here tonight. But tomorrow night, we'll be in my hometown of Richmond, and that's a dirt track. <laughs> we went, the next day in Richmond, I met everybody in town that he knew, and they all met the famous big car driver from the Midwest. Come out tonight and watch the show. Fellas, to this day, no man in the racing business can explain to you how I did it, and I can't tell you how I did it. But I qualified for the feature event, 14th starting position. I'm in 14th spot, but I've got to explain something to you now. I've got to explain to you how to drive a dirt track. Some of you know how, but there are others that don't, so I must explain this. Now, this was a half-mile dirt track. And on a dirt track, you go down the straightaways at full throttle. And at the end of a straightaway, you lift your foot from the gas quickly. The compression of the engine locks the rear wheels just momentarily. At that same instant, you must throw the steering wheel to the left. And this is what throws the car into its broad slide. Then you turn the steering wheel back to the right and aim those front wheels in the direction of the slide and you punch that gas back down to the floor and you power drive through the turn. But I didn't know that. <laughs> I'm in 14th spot. We came down for the green flag. The race started. We went into the first turn and when everybody lifted their foot from the gas, not me. I went from 14th to 8th. And, and, and then they started getting in my way. Boy, I went end over end, side over side, 
and they had a 15-foot high board fence, and we got 38 feet of that. <laughs> Seven weeks later, I called Russ Wilson and told him that they were taking the casts off. <laughs> He says to me to meet him at, he gives me a date, where to meet him, when, and I go to Staunton, Virginia, and man, as I come in the pits and I shake hands with him and we're glad to see each other, all of a sudden the race cars are arriving and here comes the most beautiful ambulance I've ever seen in my life. And I said, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, look at that ambulance. He said, boy, you've got to forget about those things. <laughs> oh, I said, Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, just look at that ambulance. Oh, they're, those people in Detroit are painting ambulances pretty colors now. That ambulance is so pretty, I wouldn't mind riding in it. And Mr. Wilson said, boy, you've got to forget about those things. And just then, Mr. Wilson started vibrating, jumping up and down, and he said, <clears throat> see that car over there? See that car over there, the one that just came in? That car's from my hometown of Richmond. That's Carrie Williams from Richmond. I don't care where you finish in today's races. I don't care how far back you are. Don't let that guy from my hometown beat you. I said, yes, sir. <clears throat> now, the first thing that I noticed during the day was that the officials had started me up in number one position on the pole. And I went to them and asked them, how come I deserve to be up in the pole, up in number one spot? And they said, Eddie, we are officials because over the years we have learned to protect the lives of the other drivers. <laughs> By starting you up front, it will give all the other men in the race the opportunity of watching you and each man can take care of himself. Boy, we come down for the green flag into the first turn and I lost control. The guy got, one of them got by me. I went down that back straight away and I got in that turn, I lost control, and another one went by me. Man, I went down that front straight away to complete lap one and I went into that first turn and I lost control and two of them went by me. Boy, slowly but surely, I'm working my way back. <laughs> I went into one turn and as I lost control of the car and as I got the car straightened out again and I'm going, I took a look at the two cars that had just passed me and one of them was Kerry Williams. I said, that's Kerry Williams. That's Kerry Williams. I can't let him beat me. 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 And he didn't. When we got to the end of the back straightaway, when he lifted his foot from the gas, I went right out over his wheels, axles, and everything. <laughs> and I got to ride in that ambulance, too. <laughs> Uh, about a year and a half slips by. Fellas, I honestly became about the best Class B midget driver along the East Coast when a man offered me an Offenhauser. An Offenhauser. July the 4th at Altamont, New York, I'm going to drive an Offenhauser. We're on our way. I'm riding with him. I even went over to his home and rode with him from his home up to the track, you know, just to make sure. We're on the freeways of New York, stopped for breakfast. We're in a diner at the counter. A photographer that follows the racing circuit walked in, says, Hiya, Joe. Hi, Eddie. And he sits down. Casually looks over and says, Hey, Joe, who's driving for you today? And Joe pointed to me. An Offenhauser owner pointed to me. I, God, I sat there. Oh, I was so proud. An Offenhauser owner pointed to me as his driver. And this photographer, he looked, he leaned forward first and put his elbows on the counter, and he looked something like this. <laughs> so later on the highway, Joe asked me about it. And I said, Joe, <clears throat> Joe, that photographer knows me better than you do. And Joe said, well, he says, I, blah, 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 and he's, I think you're going to be a champion. I think this, I think that. I'm proud to be, give you the first ride in an Offenhauser. And he gives me a big song and dance. And I said, Joe, I want to become a champion this afternoon. And he said, Eddie, it'll take you eight, ten, maybe twelve races to learn how to drive an Offenhauser. 
the horsepower range is going to be so completely different from what you're accustomed to that it will take you 8, 10 to 12 races to learn how to use the horsepower properly, to learn how to make it work for you. And Eddie, it's going to be so strange to you that you won't have any control over the car at first. Now he said, I admit you've been beating Offenhausers, but you have been beating them personally, not your equipment. Now you're going to be driving some powerhouse. And Eddie, just take a ride today. Be satisfied that you're getting a chance. I'm satisfied that I'm giving a guy a break. Learn how to use that horsepower. And I said, Joe, I want to become a champion this afternoon. I'll make a deal with you. I'll either win the race below the engine or I'll stack your racing car. <laughs> and he looked back at me and he was just driving along that throughway and he said, boy, if you stack my car, you better be flying. And later that afternoon, when he came up to the hospital to see me, <laughs> boy, he stuck his head in my room door and I'm spread out among those sheets there and he says, I knew you'd never make it. <laughs> but from that, all of a sudden, I got good on the East Coast in an Offenhauser and I went to the Midwest circuit and I raced for a summer and I followed him on out to the West Coast for the winter and I'm on the West Coast I'm in Luigi Lozovsky's garage watching them hand build two Indianapolis cars. One for the late great Jack McGrath and one for Henry Banks. And I'm proud that they even just let me stand there and watch them. And the phone rings. It's a long distance operator trying to find a driver by the name of Eddie Sachs. She's calling every race car shop in California. And he's right here. And they hand me the phone and it's Floyd Trevis from Youngstown, Ohio the chief mechanic of the McNamara Motor Express Special. And Mike Nazareth and Lee Elkins have just had a fight. And Mike Nazareth won't drive for them anymore. And Lee Elkins, the owner of the McNamara Company and the McNamara Special says, Floyd, find that dumb bum sax and hire him. <laughs> Man, they're gonna, they're gonna hire me. An Indianapolis car at Phoenix, Arizona in the 100 mile event. This is the last race of the year. The next race on the circuit. See, nowadays, Trenton comes in the spring. But back in those days, Indianapolis came first. Fellas, I got to, to Phoenix, Arizona, and I'm in the pits, and they're teaching me what and how to handle an Indianapolis car, the things you have to know. And this is what they taught me. We put a big starter up in the front of the thing, 10,000 RPM aircraft starter. We're going to wind this starter up to about 10,000 and we throw a little clutch and this little clutch will engage and it will start ripping and tearing and it'll make that Offenhauser engine, which is 15, 15 and a half, 16, 16 and a half to one compression ratio. It'll make that engine turn over. And as that engine starts turning over, you throw this toggle switch and that'll then throw the switch on and the engine will fire up. We also have in the cockpit a spark retarder to make it a little easier starting. As soon as the engine fires, advance the spark to its normal position and lock it. After the engine's running, punch the clutch in and put it up in the low gear and wait. All of a sudden, you'll feel the car start to move. It will be the mechanics behind the car pushing. As we start to push and the wheels are turning and your forward momentum is started, Start letting the keep 1,500 to 1,000 to 1,500 RPMs. Start letting the clutch out easy. Let it out easy and slip it and slip it. Keep slipping that clutch until the car gets to maybe 45 miles an hour. And then you can let the clutch out all of the way. Run for just a short distance, punch the clutch back in and drop her into high gear. Lock it in gear. They have a lock on the transmission. You can lock it in high gear. And fellas, I'm not kidding you, on this big mile track at Phoenix, at the Arizona State Fairgrounds, on this enormous mile track, I did it just as perfectly as you could do it. Honestly, I left those pits, my turn to qualify came up. I left those pits, 
I slipped that clutch and slipped that clutch. Oh, man, and I finally got her going, and I gave her one good jab of the gas, and she leaped forward. I punched the clutch in, and with two hands, I reached down and dropped her into high gear. Grabbed the steering wheel with my left hand, reached down again, and I locked the transmission in gear, reached up and grabbed with my other hand on the steering wheel, and I positioned myself in the cockpit. I'm about the middle of the turn, and I'm ready, and I punched her down to the floor, and when I punched that big Offenhauser down to the floor, that thing went, meow, 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 meow. God, it started ripping and tearing dirt out of the ground, and God, it set sideways, and I turned my hands to the right and the wheels, and I'm in a hell of a slide, and I'm coming out of the turn onto the back straightaway, and I'm just before slamming against that concrete wall, and it straightened out okay, and I'm on that long back straightaway, and I got her nice and straight, and I'm started down that back straightaway. I looked down at the oil pressure gauge, the fuel pressure gauge, and when I looked back up, it was too late. <laughs> Honestly, fellas, it took a derrick to load her back on the trailer. <laughs> and naturally, the following spring, Nobody wanted to hire me for Indianapolis. <laughs> but the following year, a man hired me. Fellas, I'm hired to drive this, the 500-mile race, and i got to take my driver's test. And you all know what it's like, the 10 laps at each speed. I'm on 105 test, and quickly and easily, with my mathematical training, with my college education, and the knowledge that I had as a racing driver, I quickly figured out that it was ridiculous what these other drivers were doing. 105 miles per hour, average speed. They want me to run 10 laps, and all these drivers that I've been watching do this lift their foot at the end of the straightaways, coast through the turns. They just get on the gas on the straightaways. It's ridiculous. With a paper and pencil, the tire size, the gear ratio, I figured out that 3,800 RPMs was 105 miles per hour. And I drew a red line through 3,800 and rolled from the pits and made 10 consecutive perfect 105 mile an hour laps around the Indianapolis Speedway. They thought I was a genius. Man, I didn't even get a bad lap. Boy, I'm in the pits and they're patting me and I'm really good and boy, that's a terrific kid. And now I went back to the garage and I got the paper and the pencil. Next test is 115. Boy, and I figured it out. 4,300 RPMs. Drew a red line through 4,300. I left the pits through the first and the second turn, boy, and I'm on the back straight away, and I drove the needle up, 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 and I got her to 4,300, and I leveled her off, and I held her steady. Now, when you're on a driver's test, you must always stay over on the inside half of the track because the track is open for practice. And let's take Roger Ward as an example. If Roger Ward were practicing, and I'm running a 115 mile an hour test, when he passes you, it's something like this. So boy, you stay way over on the inside. I'm way over on the inside, and by the way, when you're way over on the inside, it's just like this. The Indianapolis Speedway is built like a great rectangle. If you're over against the outside wall, when you get down to the here, you can turn from the outside and come across the inside and come or skim across the corner and then drift back up to the wall again. But when you're on the inside of the track, when you get down to the end down here, it's a solid left-hand turn. Man, I got her there at 4,300 and I'm holding her steady. And as I entered into the third turn and turn left, I was going just a little bit too fast. Now, I knew I was going too fast, and I knew that I had lost control of the car because the first thing that I heard was the voice of Firestone. <laughs> the voice of Firestone. All of a sudden, you hear this. Eat. Men, they had always told me, many, all the old-time drivers had told me, if you ever lose control of a car, if you ever lose a control of the car at the speedway, get set for it. Get ready to hit that concrete wall because it's a tremendous concussion. Reach down between your legs and drive, grab the drive shaft. 
Boy, and I reached down and I grabbed the drive shaft. Man, I got her, and I got a hold of that drive shaft. I'm hanging on to that drive shaft, and I've got my head ducked down, and I'm pulling myself tight, and I said to myself, when am I going to hit the wall? 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 Fellas, that car spun three and a half times, went 565 feet, never hit a thing, stopped on the infield, perfectly safe, but I don't know that. Man, I'm down there waiting to hit that wall. <laughs> it had rained the night before, and the infield was a sogginess and a muddiness, and I was getting hit by everything in the world, and there was a, I'm a mass of mud, and open cockpit car, and the mud's coming through the air, and I'm spinning, and oh, fellas, when the yellow light went on, Elk Knock was driving the ambulance this day, and Elk Knock, he said to me later, he said, Eddie, Eddie, when the yellow light went on, I ran for the ambulance, threw the key on, and I let that clutch fly, and I take off. And Eddie, he says, as I'm tearing out of the pits, I heard somebody holler, it's sax. Oh, Eddie, oh, Eddie, he says, oh, oh, he said, I, when I heard it was you, my drinking buddy. <laughs> Oh, Eddie, he says, oh, he says, I went into the number one turn and through the number one turn and I'm on a short straightaway and I'm looking for you, Eddie. I'm looking for you. Old Elk Knock's looking for you, Eddie. By the way, I better explain to you who Elk Knock is. <laughs> Elk Knock is really Conkle, the funeral home director in Indianapolis. <laughs> but if you spell Conkle backwards, it's Elk Knock. <laughs> And Elk Knox says to me, <laughs> Elk Knox says, Eddie, oh, Eddie, he says, I'm going across the short straightaway and I'm looking for you. I'm looking for my drinking buddy. Oh, he says, I went into that number two turn, Eddie, and I got through that number two turn and I got on the back straightaway and I'm going down that back straightaway, Eddie, and I'm looking for you, Eddie. Oh, he said, I'm looking for you. And all of a sudden, I looked down and I saw the speedometer. A hundred miles an hour. Eddie, Eddie, I just lifted my foot from the gas, and I punched the brake, and I slowed that ambulance down, and I said to myself, he isn't worth it. <laughs> he went through the number three turn, crossed the short straightaway, and I'm parked over in the infield. He drove the ambulance over to my race car, threw the door open, jumped out, runs over to me, and I'm down there waiting to hit the wall. He taps me on the shoulder and hollers, are you okay? Boy, that's something new. <laughs> and it snapped me. And I realized that I'd stopped and that I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Boy, and I push back up straight and I'm sitting in the cockpit straight and from my helmet, from my helmet right straight down I'm a solid mass of mud all the way down I'm solid mud and I I look out towards the straightaway look to the left I look to the right I looked up in the sky and I hollered I'm blind I'm blind I can't see I can't see and he says you dumb so-and-so take your goggles off <laughs> Fellas, honestly, you men right here, you men are looking at a man who can claim something that nobody else in the entire racing business can claim. There has never been in the history of the Indianapolis Speedway, there never has been and I don't think there ever will be a man who can say the things that I can say and get away with. Honestly. This man right here standing before you has been beyond a shadow of a doubt the greatest failure in the history of the Indianapolis Speedway. In 1953, I failed my driver's test. Actually, I explained to you how. <laughs> in 1954, I returned to the track and failed my driver's test. I became the first man in the history of the Indianapolis Speedway to fail his driver's test twice. There have been some men that have failed it once and have never come back. There have been some men who have failed it once 
have come back and passed it. But there has never been anybody that has failed it twice. In 1955, I failed my driver's test again. I made sure that nobody would ever break my records. <laughs> And in 1956, I passed the driver's test and became the first man in the history of the track to run a 40-lap test. I ran 10 consecutive 105s, 10 consecutive 115s, 10 consecutive 120s, 10 consecutive 125s. We didn't have a speedometer. We didn't have a tachometer. We didn't even have an oil pressure gauge in the cockpit with me. We took all the gauges out of the car, and we just put me in there. And without, with just me in the seat of my pants, we ran the most perfect driver's test that has ever been run in the history of the track. And immediately they called a big press conference. And all the newspaper men and the TV and the radio guys, they all assembled at one point and they all started shooting questions at me. And the first question, one newspaper man said, how did you do it? And I looked at all of them and I said, well, fellas, I've had more experience than all the other drivers. <laughs> and then I qualified for the race, and I was the 34th fastest. I missed her by one slot. And that one slot changed my whole life. It's funny how things can happen to you. But I stood there. If a man couldn't start the race, I could go. I had my engine running. They're on the pace lap. If the 33 can't start, I can go. And all of a sudden, they're coming off the number four corner, and they're coming down for the start, and I climbed out of my own cockpit and stood on the tail of my racing car trying to watch the start of the race. And a newspaper man ran up, and a, and a, a radio fellow with a microphone on a worldwide radio, and he's telling the people all over the world that right here sits a man ready to go. If one man can't go, if one man can't start, Eddie Sachs is right here and he's ready to go. Let's see what happens. They're coming down for the start. Here they come and... And they all go by and all 33 cars are running. Eddie, Eddie, and we're on worldwide radio, armed services overseas. My, my God, and the man says to me, Eddie, Eddie... Eddie, were you hoping that somebody would have bad luck so that you could start the race? And I grabbed that mic from that fella, and I took a hold of it, and I said, No, I wasn't wishing anybody would have bad luck, because next year, I wouldn't want anybody to wish me bad luck. And the following year, front row, second spot. The following year, 18th spot. And I was in second spot at the end of lap one. The next year, I was in second spot. The next year, I was on the pole, and I darn near won the race. And then the following year, I did win the race, but they paid A.J. Foyt for it. <laughs> and I got second. And then last year, started 27th and worked my way to third. And fellas, if any one of you have ever bet on me, you have lost. But this year, this year, double up. Because, boy, we're going all the way to victory lane. We're going to end my career as a racing driver. And, fellas, if the guys at the racing world, if the guys at the Indianapolis Speedway, if all those drivers would just let me win the race, they could be rid of me real easy. <laughs> <laughs> be the fastest way they could ever get rid of me. <laughs> How about it? Questions from the floor. Shoot. Somebody have a question from the floor. I know you do. Don't be embarrassed. Shh. Talk up just like as if I was, uh... <laughs> if I was right out. Okay. Uh, ta and the funny part about it is that the 12-inch wheel is the same thing as the uh, same wheels or the same tires and wheels that we use on midget racing cars. Uh, right here at your Lafayette Speedway as an example when you ran on the flat asphalt. But the 12-inch uh, wheels will most likely become part of the history of the Speedway because they keep learning to make the tires better and better and they don't have to make them as big. 
They used to have to make them big just to keep them from stretching. So I imagine that it will happen. Whether it will be this year or not, I'm not sure, but it will happen. My laundry bill? Uh, it's, uh, all right, it's a good question. My, my laundry bill is about $45 for the month of May. <clears throat> about $45 is what my laundry bill is for the month of May. Any other questions? Come on, shoot. Here's a good one. Uh, I'm asked if, is it true in qualifications do these fellows really have to scare themselves to get up to speed? Do they really have to go overboard? I'm going to go further than that and explain to you that when a driver is running 140 miles an hour, and this is the fastest lap he's ever turned, and he comes over to me and he says, Hey, Eddie. You're running 147, 148 every lap, and the fastest lap I can turn is 140. What am I doing wrong? Will you go down in the turn and watch me and tell me if it, what the heck I'm doing wrong? And before I ever go down in the turn and watch him, I always say to him, my friend, have you got it lost? Now when I say, have you got it lost, I'm saying, have you lost control of the automobile as you enter the turn? And the guy looks at me and says, no. Well, I said, there's your problem. <laughs> Man, if you've got the car under control, you can't be going fast. Anybody can drive one under control. That's the easiest thing to do. The idea is to drive one out of control. <clears throat> and this is really technically the theory behind driving a racing car. You've got to have it lost. And if you don't have it lost, pack up and go home. And this is what makes the racing driver against the fellow that would like to be a racing driver and never does make it. Boy, you get a little wild sometimes, but... <laughs> well, with wind drafts and with... Uh, now, in the stock car racing business at Daytona Beach, Florida, on the big two-and-a-half-mile speedway at Daytona, they actually draft each other because they do have a big automobile and or similar to a tractor trailer on the highway. You can run behind a tractor trailer. You could most likely take a Volkswagen as an example and run behind a tractor trailer. Well, let's take a, a, let's take a Ford. You could run behind a tractor trailer and if you would sit directly against the, the tail of a tractor trailer truck with your Ford and run down the highway, you would most likely get eight miles to the gallon of gas.